Oh, here comes a sick one. G'day and welcome to The Hold Down, the show that celebrates just about everything surf. Yes, even claims. I'm Ronnie Blakey and this is my co-host, a man that commentated both of Joel Parkinson's perfect heats and also challenges Joel for the title of the biggest nose in surfing. <laughs> it's Vaughn Blakey. There we go, that thing. <laughs> How are you, Vaughn? Uh, good, Doc. Good to be here. Nice to be back in the heart down, eh? Mm. Mate, this is going to be a fun show because today we're taking a trip down memory lane as we celebrate a league of absolute surfing legends. Oh, mate, I'm a bit nervous about this episode, Doggy, because as a hardcore surf fan, as a kid especially, all these guys, well, not just on my wall, I had a wall dedicated to every single one of them. I go into full Wayne's World mode when I see these guys, you know what I mean? When I think about them, eh, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. Let's rip into them. As the saying goes, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And these surfers are the ones that have paved the way. So that's why we're gonna celebrate these guys. We're gonna count down this absolute crew of surfing legends, starting with this, our number five. Ross Clark Jones, the Wiz, the wild man of Borneo, born on the 6th of the 6th, 66, it's a tongue twister, but what a legend. How much has this guy achieved in his surfing life? So much incredible stuff, starting all the way back when he was just a grom from the Seni Coast, mate. Who could have thought that he would go on to do what he has done? Awesome, isn't he? And you know, for us it really started with his performance in Mad Wax. Oh, absolute glory film. And one of the, you know, first movies, surf movies that we ever saw with a bit of acting in it. Go on, just say it. Ready? We wanna go to Pipeline. Sure we. What a performance. The entire thing scored by Ganga Jang and strangely, none of that acting was rewarded with any AFIs, BAFTAs or Oscars or anything wrong. Unbelievable, and I still want to get some of that wax. We want to go to Pipeline. That's a great idea. Sure whiz. <laughs> so good, but uh, he's gone on to doing incredible things. Uh, of course, uh, had a pro career, but then really started to focus in on the big wave scene and that's where he really made a name for himself. Really, it all kicked off with him and tow partner Tony Ray at Outer Log Cabins. That was kind of when we first started seeing tow surfing and surfing waves that were too big to paddle come into the sphere of the surfing world. But, you know, after that, Ross just honed in because he had found what he loved to do, and that was chase the biggest swells imaginable, and the big target was the eddy. Yeah, big wave surfing for a while there was all about tow surfing, but Ross Clark Jones, as you said, wanted that Eddie title, it's all about paddling, and he went out there, he proved his big wave chops, and he became the first Australian to win that contest. That is crazy, and the Eddie I cow, there is no big wave contest more prestigious than that bad boy. That is the one they all want. Ross put his target on it for a long, long time, Ron. He came so close, but getting that win, immortal. Unbelievable, and then he really shifted his focus again to putting himself in the path of the biggest storms he could find out there in our oceans. And he spent time chasing waves in the deep south, and then he found, uh, found himself posted up over there in Portugal, looking to get a piece of Nazare. Oh, and what a piece he got. He got almost ripped to pieces out there. Copped a couple of absolutely brutal hidings, and that's just part of the course when you're Ross Clark Jones. He knows how to take a beating, and he described it as getting hit in the head with pots and pans underwater. Just to add to the legendary status of this bloke, of course the big wave surfing is one thing, but when he was called up to, to take part in Survivor <laughs> and was medically evacuated after fracturing his ankle, for me he just skyrocketed. Oh uh, mate, well my favourite thing on that whole series of Survivor was when he finally got back to uh, the land of the living and had 16 coffees in a row and just spewed in a bush. Unbelievable performance, <laughs> Ross, we love you mate. Good on you Ross. <laughs> Oh, here comes a sick one. This is The Hold Down, and today we're tipping our cap to some of the sports greats, and our number four rock and rolled his way into our list. Four. Matt Hoy, 
What a legend. Lucky enough to call him one of my best mates. We're on. I've spent a lot of quality time with Hoy over the years. Name drop. Yeah, sorry, I won't do that again. <laughs> He's just the quintessential Aussie. He's the quintessential rock and roller, and he lives with his heart on his sleeve and passion to burn. He's just an absolute champion. Three championship tour wins, but none more famous than what he did down there in 97 at Bells Beach. 1997 was a great year for Australian surfing, but a really great year for the people in Newcastle because Matt Hoy got down to Bells Beach, rang that mighty bell, the trophy that everyone wants to win, and he reckons inspired his hometown team, the Newcastle Knights, to a premiership win in the footy. How good's that? Yeah, awesome stuff. But Hoyo, you know, the, the wins aside, I, I think it's his surfing that kind of puts him up there in legendary, the legendary realm for us. Yeah, he's a V8 power hound. He's an absolute mongrel out in the water. Big, fast, speedy surfing, huge, huge hacks. I mean, Hoy, hack, they go together. Music, magic. He was really against the grain for a lot of the guys, the personalities and the surfing that was going on at the time. You know, we had the momentum generation coming through, we had uh, Kelly Slater, we had all this new school. And in the thick of it, getting results, getting comp wins, getting through heats and setting the world on fire with that classic Aussie power surfing was Matt Hoy. So he's a real against the grain kind of character, but everyone loved him. For sure. I, I think too, you know, you, you really show your true core self as a surfer if you start shaping your own boards. For sure, and that's what he's doing now. So Hoyo, still in Yui, still a power hound, still one of the most lovable legends around, and an absolute champion of a bloke. Epic philosophy too with his custom orders. You go to Hoyo, you tell him you want a board, you start giving him the dimensions, he says, <laughs> ah, 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 ah. You get what you get and you don't get upset. You can only pick up your custom order on a Friday afternoon <laughs> with a carton of beer. So some very important ground rules laid down there. Yeah, and also I don't know too many other pro surfers with a full page from a Dr. Zeus book tattooed on their thigh. Live and let live. That's the Hoyo mantra. Take a leaf out of his book. All right, well, Matt Hoy, big props to you, mate. Definitely up there as one of our favourite surfers of all time. But our next character is one of Europe's finest. This is our number three. Jeremy Flores, 31 years of age, the youngest on our list, and for good reason, he's the best surfer from Europe ever. Oh. Ooh la la, Jeremy! I love him, he's such a breath of fresh air on that tour. Ever since he first got on, I mean, he was a child prodigy for years before he even got on tour, but once he did get on there, there were world title aspirations for this kid. But what I loved about him was his attitude, Ron. He got on there, he spoke his mind, he surfed hard, and he lived up to his full potential, getting two Pipe Masters victories and a big win at Chobes. Has there been a better tube rider on tour? I mean, there have been some freaks, but this guy matches it with the very best of them. The thing I think that people sometimes forget is just how young Flores was when he got onto the championship tour. 17 years of age, cracked the top 10 in his first year, got the Rookie of the Year title, and, and mate, since then has collected three of uh, the biggest event wins the sport knows. And, and his legacy is firmly intact. He has well and truly hit legendary status. But for me, I think my favourite performance came in Tahiti. Because that year, 2015, Flores, just a couple of months prior to the uh, Tahiti event getting underway, smashed his face in, trying an air in Indo, and actually fractured his skull. So he uh, bravely came back to competition. A couple of events later, donned the gaff helmet and threw himself over the ledge and powered his way to victory. It's crazy to think, isn't it, that Europe have had so many great surfers over all these years. I mean, we're kind of spoiled in, in America, in Australia. We've got such long histories of legendary guys to really aspire to be like. But in Europe, Jeremy Flores, I think, is just in a whole different realm, isn't he? He's, he's the guy that every single grommet over there in France and probably right through that whole continent looks to as, that's what I can do, that's what we're capable of. So, Jeremy Flores, we salute you, mate. You're an absolute legend, the youngest in this list, and you're a Ted Seat champion of a bloke as well. Yes, an absolute legend. We'll stick around because after the break, we'll reveal number two on our list of absolute legends here on The Hold Down. Oh, 
Oh, here comes a sick one. Welcome back to the show. Today on The Hold Down, we are celebrating some of the sport's biggest legends, thanks to Quicksilver. And we've got another big one for you here. Here is number two on our list. Oh, I just need a moment to compose myself here, Ron, because at number two, it is the Lord of Froth, the human cappuccino, Thomas Victor Carroll. Oh, I love him. I was just a huge fan as a grommet. Had entire walls, like I said, dedicated to this guy that I would update with every new issue of a magazine that would come out. He was just the all-time legend. I just identified so much with how little he was, but just how much heart he had when it came to charging like a maniac. And the cool thing about Thomas Victor Carroll is the fact that, you know, he just never disappoints to give you that energy, to give you that froth, that love of surfing. He's something special, mate. Yeah, Pipeline is an incredible place. It's got such a intense energy. Thanks very much for recognising the efforts out there, boys. Two-time world champion, three-time Pipeline master, winner of countless CT events in a career that is absolutely fabled in surfing. But one thing that you always hear about Tom Carroll is every single one of his peers celebrate him as the guy who was setting the benchmark. He was setting the benchmark. He was surfing's first million dollar man. He trained harder than anyone. When you looked at him physically, and you look at him now, he's still so ripped and yeah. ready to just tear into any wave that comes his way. He's still got a body like a sock full of walnuts. He's absolutely cut like a little Greek statue, like the statue of David, only with a bigger leaf. <laughs> <laughs> but Ron, when we talk about Tom, what we really remember is Tom Carroll and the Pipeline together. What a marriage. There's only a handful of surfers that didn't really just survive the break, that actually went out there and just styled their way through one of the most treacherous surf locations on the planet. And he attacked it. I mean, the bottom turns that he would do out there, the snap, the famous snap, heard around the world. These are the images we think of when we think of Tom Carroll at Pipe. And the other thing is, no claims, Ron. He'd fly out of the barrel and instead of throwing his arms in the air or looking at the judges or clapping himself, he just come out and cleaver that thing in half, mate. Cleaver it! Yeah, one thing that he hates is when surfers these days get barreled at pipe and they come out, they look at the beach and they kick out. And he was going, hey, what, about, what about a cutback? <laughs> what about a turn? Give me something. There's still more wave to surf. You wasted it. You wasted that in section. Yeah, Tom Carroll, hard to believe someone who's dropped in on so many thousands of people can be so beloved. <laughs> What an absolute lord. We love Tom Carroll. We love seeing that vision of Tom. It never gets old, Vaughan. Never. And uh, let's get him back in the Pipe Masters, hey? Can we get him a spot in the event as a wild card? Do it, WCL. Do it, was all. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll reveal our number one on our list of legends and also introduce you to a cast of legends to be. Today on The Hold Down, we've been celebrating some of the legends of the sport. It's been a lot of fun, Vaughan. You've got, to, you've got to put these guys right up there where they deserve to be, right up there in lights. Yeah, they're not, they're not humans. They're, they're immortals. They're gods. They're beings, celestial, walking among us. Like, I can't even believe they're all still here and we get to enjoy their company. Yes, well, we've reached that point in the show, Vaughan, where it's time to reveal number one on our list of absolute surfing legends. And there could be only one, the greatest Australian surfer of all time, Mark Richards. Four times world champion. How do you feel? You know how we feel. <laughs> I love him, our mate. Dead set, nicest bloke, quietly spoken, goes about his business without even 
you know, without troubling the waters whatsoever, but one of the most ruthless competitors ever. I mean, you don't win four world titles by making friends with everyone, do you? No. As far as his rivals are concerned, the guy could be an absolute mongrel. Mate, any advantage that MR could get, he would take. In fact, to the point where when everyone was shaping their own boards on tour, he developed a design that put him head and shoulders above everyone, mostly because he was all, almost one of the only guys who could surf it, and that was the twin fin. The wounded gull, that knock-kneed style, it just fit beautifully with the way that those boards surfed. And he took him into every type of condition and totally dominated Ron. The other thing about MR, look at the list of the contests that he's won. He's a pipeline master. People don't even mention that with them when they think about MR most of the time. Bells Beach champion. He won every event all around the world and really before Kelly Slater, it felt like no one was ever gonna reach that mark that he had set with the four champs. MR actually started off as a shaper. That's what he was going to do. And then he discovered the talent that he had for surfing. Beautiful marriage of skill, knowledge, heat strategy. He just ticked every box. And if you talk to Steph Gilmore, Mick Fanning, you know, the champions that we've had ever since, they all look to MR as the number one guy for advice, for strategies, for basically just an overall picture of how their game is going. The guy basically earned his place at the very top of Australian surfing for a long, long time. And the ultimate compliment, Ron, when Surfing Australia did their big list of the 50 most influential surfers of all time, who was at number one? MR. No disputing that. Yeah, one of our favourite styles as well, just uh, the wounded gull. It, it, it's just burning my brain forever and I'll always try and emulate it. <laughs> How am I going? Pretty good job. <laughs> Mark Richards, eternal legendary status for that man. But there is a group of young guns coming through the ranks at the moment that have the potential to reach legendary status. Kanoe Garashi is one of those surfers. Oh, how good is this guy going? The first Japanese surfer to ever win a WCT event. What happened to this guy in the last year, Ron? Because he had all that talent. We knew he was gonna be a force when he got on tour, but this year in particular, he has taken his game to another level. Yeah, well, he was such a wiry little kid when he first got on the championship tour, just a teenager. But in recent years, he's really started to fill out and as a result, started to really pack some power into his surfing. And at the championship tour event in Bali, he was near perfect. Mm. Just really clean rails. You know, I think he's got a, just a precision in his surfing that, that is really hard to match. And it's really hard for the judges to deny him those big scores now. Well, I really loved the variety in his surfing at Karama. Sometimes you just see guys go to their safety turns. He was throwing stuff all over the place. Big floaters, big tail drifts, absolutely flaring. What I'm really excited about with Kanoa, he's got a hometown Olympic Games coming up. Imagine it. Imagine him surfing in Japan in front of the whole country. He's a dead set good shot for that gold medal, mate. Watch out, everyone else. Here comes Kanoa. Yep, already hit legendary status over there in Japan, but now chasing that international uh, legendary status as well, and uh, you'd back him to do it. 100%. Now, another young gun, which we've been keeping our eye on, Leonardo Fioravanti, the first Italian surfer to make the grade on the championship tour, and I think the reason that we're, we're so interested to see where Leonardo goes is the fact that he's had some major hurdles. Broken back at Pipeline. I mean, that takes a lot of coming back from Ron. Again, another kid who had uh, access to sort of Kelly Slater as he was a kid growing up. Not many kids get this, that sort of constant surfing with him, picking his brain, being sort of mentored by the guy, and he delivered instantly. Little Aussie Grom, Lennox Chell from the Central Coast of New South Wales, just continues to, uh, that place just continues to produce such amazing surfing talent. This kid has a big future. Hale Walsh, 
a young gun from the west, knows how to throw monster hucks way out into the flats. It's amazing how much control these kids have in the air on. Even better than that, he knows how to pack it. Most of the kids over there on those heavy reefs, they know how to get really deep on really heavy waves. And that end section, they're not going to waste it. They're going to the air. And finally, Ron, Kauli Vast. What about this guy's performance at Tahiti? Wins the trials, gets right deep into the draw with some of the best tube riding we saw, and even better, where's he at? On ya! Yeah, defeated the current world number one at the time there, Chloe Andino, in a high-scoring heat. For me, this kid has already hit legendary status. A lot of the championship tours are talking about him. Kauli Vast is a superstar of the future. Unfortunately, Vorna, that's all we got time for on today's show, but... Damn it! That was fun, mate. <laughs> Run, was fun. Running through an incredible list of surfing legends and also uncovering some future stars. Make sure you tune in next week as we celebrate all there is to celebrate in the world of surf.